Hey guys, Drifter here. Today I've got a video for you about critical race theory and why it is designed to distract you from other things in life that are far more important. I realize this is an unpleasant topic. Take a moment, breathe. I can hear the angry comments. I can see the dislikes, comments about this as a gaming channel, but just relax. We're gonna do a basic analysis today and it's a topic that I initially intended to completely avoid but it just kept coming back. I just couldn't escape it. Most of you are probably familiar with this topic because you've seen clips of angry school board meetings with parents like this. And they say things like this. The Western culture and values that brought forth Christianity in the founding documents are being called evil and racist. I'm reminded of the tyranny of communist China. And sometimes it gets so bad they have to get arrested like this. Those of you that follow the news have probably seen a lot of commentators with a lot of spicy opinions about this topic. If those opinions weren't spicy enough for you, you can search for Critical Race Theory on YouTube. My first result was PragerU, the fake university that's really more of an ideological think tank, and then tons of videos about CRT of wildly differing opinions from black voices to analysis to opinion to anti-white people kind of stuff, and basically just a big mess of gobbledygook, and I have no idea how I could learn anything on this platform. And I feel that it's a topic I shouldn't even have to talk about. I'm just a gamer who isn't even wearing sleeves today. It's very hot in Texas, so I'm dressed purely for my own comfort. But sadly, this is flooding over into every timeline that I have going on. If I get on YouTube, this video, so if I turn on the news, it's just constantly in the news. If I open up Twitter, it's tons of other gamers like me with political opinions that I cannot possibly escape and I'm contributing to it, so I guess I could put my own clown makeup on. Funny story about that tweet example, that was actually part of a very large exchange and argument that I had with Tim Pool about critical race theory and election conspiracies and other things, it was really bizarre for me to kind of get sucked into the actual newsy part of the news and have to defend my beliefs, but I think it did a super good job. It was a, it's a really fun read if you want to go through the whole thread, and I linked it below. If I go to the gym, it's on the TV at the gym. If I drive around, it's on billboards here. I can't escape. People are fighting tooth and nail over this in my home state of Texas, and it only seems to be accelerating with time, so I decided I'm going to say my piece early and then move on with life. So today's video has two components. The first component is why I believe critical race theory is a big nothing burger that's designed to distract you and waste other people's efforts. And number two is what, well, it's basically a definition of what critical race theory actually is and what it's not. I realize this is kind of a spicy one now because basically everything race related is being called critical race theory, which isn't really true. And I'm going to do these two in reverse order. I feel like it's more appropriate to like define a thing before I go and criticize it and take a dump on it. But if you just want to see that second part, I've got timestamps down there below, like little chapters on the YouTube video. So what is critical race theory? This is the fast and dirty version by a game analyst and not a professor. This theory is something that most of you would have only experienced if you pursued a law degree at an Ivy League university. If you were gonna be a proper lawyer, you know, pass the bar, go work in the legal field, and you went to a really nice posh college, this is something that you might get in a class. If you're doing this at smaller universities, uh, state universities, some private colleges, you might not see it at all. You might have it as an elective class. It might be bundled into some other things in the curriculum. But basically, this is a legal theory, or perhaps better said, a framework for analysis tool to be used on legal issues. This is designed for lawyers, for politicians, people that study constitutional law, for lobbyists and things like that. And it is an extension of something that's called critical theory. And I feel that it's kind of important to at least briefly talk about critical theory before we talk about critical race theory, which I, it, it branches off. Critical theory was born in the 1930s in Germany and based on some of the works of Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud. It's sort of a social philosophy that believes societal structures, the institutions, you know, the police, the school, the bank, the doctors, the lawyers, whatever, cause most of the social problems. When we start making artificial structures and power hierarchies, they have inherent problems because they're a man-made imperfect thing. And this was kind of designed to criticize and challenge the power structures that be. The professors that came up with this were basically old liberal Germans that were living in Austria and Vienna at the time, complaining about the rise of fascism in Germany, talking about the plight of the working man, exploring a lot of new and interesting philosophical ideas. And these people definitely did read, work, dabble, and exercise in varying levels of Marxist philosophy. 
I think that's a very scary thing for a lot of people to hear, and they kind of think of it like a cult. It's like a poison, like you touch it like a black hole and it just sucks you in and there's kind of no escaping. It'll just constantly be in your brain. And that might be true for some people, but in this case, these weren't exactly zealots or diehard believers. These were more like practical philosophers that would read anything and everything by every philosopher ever and analyze them and pick them apart and try to make hybrid babies of different philosophers and kind of use these philosophies as a tool to create something new would be a better way to explain what they were doing instead of just like, yeah, we love Marx because that's not really true. However, in all seriousness, some origins of the theory do involve Marxist philosophy. And I'm going to give you an IRL spoiler. If you want to study philosophy, you'll find that he inspired a lot of philosophies that many of us now more or less so ascribe to. Yeah, so basically old German philosophy and legal professors came up with the idea that the institutions that society creates ultimately creates a lot of its problems, and you can use this critical theory to criticize those institutions. We're moving away from critical theory into critical race theory, the one that we're actually talking about today, and it's a very similar legal analysis philosophy tool that focuses more on race and less on institutions in general. This is something that was invented by academics in the United States, so it focuses a lot on race relations in the United States. Now, critical race theory has a lot of different variations from professor to academic to different professor or legal scholar or whatever, but it does have a few basic premises that are more or less universal. Number one is that race issues in the United States are structural, just like critical theory, and that they are largely created by the institutions that we create. We created them imperfectly, and you can say it was on purpose or on accident or subconsciously or just lazily, but a lot of the race-related issues in the U.S. are held in place by some institution or another, the police, the government, the banking system, the food system, uh, any, any sort of thing like that, traffic laws, if you want to go that crazy. It also proposes that the U.S. has issues with prejudices in our society and that these prejudices influence our decisions and ultimately cause us to uphold these institutions instead of challenging them. Another huge component on this one is a word called intersectionality. That is a massive, massive topic that is difficult to get into, but the shortest version is, is you can have more than one struggle at a time. You can be black, or you can be a black woman in a misogynist world, or you can be a handicapped black woman in a man's world, and you can have multiple layers of issues, and also issues can come in and intersect you at unexpected angles and times in your life. So when these little prejudices come into action, they intersect your life somewhat unpredictably and work together to create what is known as white supremacy. Critical race theory proponents believe that racism is a normal facet of society for everyone, and that's of every color, white, black, Spanish, Asian, whatever, that everybody can be racist and everybody can experience racism. They believe that laws can be enforced more strictly, less strictly, or worse ways than they are written. They, laws themselves can be abused, so being lawful isn't necessarily being good. And interestingly, this theory broadly opposes modern liberalism. It's actually one of their core components, because they believe that liberalism is something of a failed ideology. They strongly criticize liberal ideas such as affirmative action, colorblindness, which I think is one of the stupidest things in the world, role modeling, uh, which would be model minorities, and there's sort of an empathetic fallacy that they don't like from modern liberalism, which means to say that uh, a lot of mm, liberal philosophy kind of believes that if you can make somebody empathize with another person's plight and struggle and understand it, then you will inherently be motivated to fix it and that creating empathy fixes the problem and they believe that's kind of nonsense because people are going to live their lives however they want empathetic or not and feeling bad for somebody isn't the same as really fixing it then they there's, there's a little bit about equity versus equality equity versus equality is another super complicated topic and i'm aware of many of you uh tying that into sort of stalinist ideologies but it's it's something for a different video but it's basically the idea that instead of equal opportunity, we should work to elevate everybody to an equal level and make sure that you know some people are born with more opportunity than others, so some people need more help than others. So getting an equal amount of help doesn't bring everybody up to the same level. You need an equitable amount of help, which is a slightly more complicated thing. So there are some interesting notes at this point on what critical race theory is. And one of the ones that worries me is that it relies more heavily on social constructionism which is group studying, group psyches, group beliefs, group ideologies, and less so an individual. It focuses very heavily on like collective social decisions and less on an individual decision, yet at the same time also uses storytelling for examples and relatability. 
They do this because they believe that sometimes telling a story from a different perspective, adding more context or understanding behind it can really change the meaning outside of an empirical XYZ thing kind of happened. And storytelling and telling personal stories hits home more than sort of like an analytical numerical study like is race good, bad, you know, and you get some metrics and you measure it with some polls and some numbers or whatever. They much more so like the story element of this. There's quite a bit of stuff in there about standpoint epistemiology, which is the idea that a member of a minority group has an authority and ability to speak more about racism than members of other racial groups because they do not have that standpoint or perspective. Generally, this overall theory doesn't like analytical and numerical data. That's one of the things that they kind of oppose about liberalism and enlightenment ideas was you can just study and measure everything and science is great, woohoo, we're done. They don't really like that because they feel that you can hide things in statistics and manipulate numbers and sort of distract from the issue. I like the quote from Mark Twain that there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. When it comes to me personally studying this topic and constructing this video, this is my biggest sticking point. You're talking at like a data guy, an analyst guy. I've been doing analysis for years and years and years and years. So I love numbers, I love quantification, and I'm really averse to experiential theories because experiences can vary so wildly and I use the numbers to get an aggregate theory. So that's basically what it's kind of being taught right now. I don't think that any of these are super insane topics, but they might be upsetting to some people. This American version was created by a variety of lawyers, professors, philanthropists, and activists like the people you see on the screen, and it pulls in some writings and some ideals from older activists like Frederick Douglass or Sojourner Truth, and it's basically the people that are doing it now are all modern American theoretical law professors, mostly like the PhD crowd, right? So then the question becomes, why is this master's level law elective being taught in our public schools? And well, basically it's not. Do you remember some of those angry clips I played in the very beginning of this video? Well, here's one of the board members that had to sit through these presentations talking about exactly how much critical race theory is being taught in his school. While people can come down and talk about anything they want to talk about, um, it is not something that is being taught or even uh, discussed right now in Rochester Public Schools. Equity very much is, but not critical race theory. That's true of most of these school boards and most of these meetings. There's pe pe people and parents protesting and angry about critical race theory when it's not even being taught in their school, which is kind of crazy. However, there is some trickle down from academia because academia influences all aspects of our life. I mean, this is our professors, our researchers. This is where we're doing crazy new social structures, science, legal theories, all sorts of crazy stuff. So there's a trickle down. It's sort of a uh, a marketplace of ideas, and some of these ideas do make it to the real world outside of universities. So critical race theory suggests that teaching children about some of these topics in a relevant way early on helps make them more aware of the problems, and thus likely to fix them, in the future. This type of teaching and this suggestion also works really well with what's known as modern relevancy teaching, which means when you teach a kid a fact, you try to tie it into that kid's daily life. Like, you teach a kid about the rain cycle on a day that it rains, and then you ask him to explain it. If something happens in the news that's roughly mirroring a history lesson, you ask them to try to compare the two and do anything to tie into some relevancy to their life so that these, these little kids remember this stuff. So what is being taught in public schools is a super light version of this, like far lighter than what this YouTube video went into, because let's be honest, these are public school kids. They don't want to read about different like legal philosophies here, okay? You're getting like little trickles of this, and it will vary from school to school and who's teaching it. There are some teachers that do this very light, not at all, and some people that go full cuckoo crazy with this kind of stuff. But generally, kids in school are gonna learn stuff like structural racism in the Jim Crow era South, and then try to find a modern day equivalent or an effect that Jim Crow racism in the South has on today. They're gonna learn about the Trail of Tears and then have a little lesson about how does that affect today? And the answer is, well, the Indians got moved off their land to a different reservation. You kind of understand some of their history. Anything basically that talks about the not so great parts of Manifest Destiny or the founding of America, because if any of you study history, America is not perfect by a long, long shot. We've got some problems. So teaching a lot of the negatives can be associated with critical race theory. Kids will learn things about perspective and context and stories, kind of like the uh, example we were talking about earlier of not focusing on analytics. They'll learn a stuff about civil rights that is definitely not friendly or appealing to those who live in the South and are proud of their states. 
They do have some topics about universal beauty standards that I see on occasion in some of these curriculums, which is like, so basically black women have a lot of problems being said that they're less beauty because of their skin or the hair or the makeup or the various things that they do. So they talk about, you know, you're beautiful with your natural body and just little healthy life lessons for kids so that they don't grow up like hating their body as an adult. And in many schools, white children are being taught that they benefit from the system and the society's perception of them in that system. And I don't think that's really far from the truth. And I think that last point is really like the sticking point is that some teachers in schools will take and even understanding for the trickle down effect of the teaching is that some of these kids might start to think that they're inherently evil or bad because they benefit from the system. When in reality, the goal is to just try to make sure that everybody benefits from the system. But because these types of lessons are taught by different school teachers from all over the U.S. with different school boards, different curriculums, different political goals, different levels of crazy in each school, it can get weirder. It can get really bizarre. I've read uh, individual news stories, cherry picking them, mind you, about a, a mixed race child giving an F for refusing to denounce his whiteness in front of the class because he's half white, which is bizarre. Uh, there's some uh, generally using white kids in class as examples of racism. There's other ones of uh, forced speech or compulsion where you're supposed to denounce racism in school or where you're required to list your ethnic identity before the class or the teacher, which is sort of an anti-free speech, uh, compelled speech sort of thing. There was a weird story about kids for communism. There's about a dozen weird stories where teachers try to teach BLM in like a relevant topical manner. And that just is, is like liquid fire on top of all of this. These couple of examples that I'm going on are uncommon. They're definitely the cherry picked ones. They're, they're extreme. The people doing these kind of weird things don't need to be teaching. They do need to be punished. These curriculums do need to be updated. But by and large, that's not really like what's happening in schools. What's happening in schools is that they're teaching American history probably more accurately and less sort of rose colored glasses looking back, adding in some perspective from other groups that haven't had a lot of say in history and trying to tie it into like modern society and show how the, you know, the things we did a hundred years ago affect life today. And I don't think that's a super complicated topic. On this note, critical race theory is not white replacement theory. The first time I heard it, I swear I thought it was just like the old white genocide and white replacement theory and stuff like that. This is a completely unrelated topic. Although many people are familiar with that theory, they've heard it, it sounds familiar, and there's probably some brain overlap going on. At least there was for me until I did my research. So then you're gonna ask, why am I hearing about this now? If it's pretty simple, if this is just basic diversity stuff that you do in public school, and the rest of it is all like super theoretical legal things that you wouldn't see unless you're getting a master's degree in law. Well, the reason you're hearing about it is because of a conservative activist by the name of Christopher Rufo. He did a piece on this in Fox News, I think it's September 2020, just a little blurb, and he happened to be doing it when then President Trump was watching Fox News. Trump didn't like what he was seeing. He didn't like any of these teachings and plans, and he came up with a plan of his own. He formed the 1776 Commission, which you may remember is an advisory committee to help rewrite and advise school curriculums to be more pro-America and to, and literally quote, end the radicalized view of American history. So basically what they wanted to do is focus on the good things about America. We were one of the freest nations on the planet. We were a bastion of democracy, of progress, saving the world in World War II. Uh, tons of religious freedoms, freedom of speech, just tons of crazy, awesome, good stuff that we did and also get rid of all that bad stuff like slavery and you know whatever happened to the indians we'll just shrink that down to a really short chapter and not focus on it too much interestingly this commission didn't include any historians not a one lots of academics just no historians which is unusual so of course this didn't you know last too long trump lost biden moves in pretty much wipes out this whole commission immediately and goes back to the status quo of allowing schools to teach some level of trickle down critical race theory so societal structures criticism blah 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 and it kind of goes back to the where it was before and then instantly we have a social flashpoint created because we've done such a big change from this commission that's supposed to make american history great again and all the good stuff back to let's be more practical and realistic about some of the bad things we did in history and there's a huge conflict between these two groups and pow now we're at where we are today
I can't see my recording timer, but I have a feeling that was about 18 or 19 minutes of what is critical race theory. And now finally, I can talk about the important part of the video, which is why I want to tell you that this is literally a distraction. This is a complete waste of your time. One of the least important issues that we have going on in our society. It is a social issue distraction in the exact same way that pinball machine addiction is a distraction. Video game violence is a distraction. The satanic panic is a distraction. That banning Dungeons and Dragons, which is part of the satanic panic, we did a whole documentary on that one, another distraction. War on drugs or drug users, big waste of time. Trans bathrooms that people spent billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in lawsuits fighting over, complete waste of time. Trans athletes competing in sports is not something that should like create mobs and riots and angry voters and stuff. There are way simpler solutions to all of these problems. Abortion, gay marriage, these are all social issues that are offensive or scary to some group of people or another. And because they're offensive or scary, it's very easy for people to imagine these issues affecting their lives a lot more than they really do and can easily blow them out of proportion because we know that human beings aren't particularly rational animals. And it serves as an excellent focus point for conflict. Oh, we love conflict. And in doing so, in stirring this pot, politicians in the United States are able to mobilize small armies of grassroots people, which are the most effective at changing opinions, mind you, to go cause problems for the other side at a school board meeting or to protest something that doesn't exist or to push back super hard here and there and pick an issue and blow it up and conflate it to where that's the only thing for the other side to talk about because one side only wants to talk about critical race issues while ignoring other massive issues in the United States and around the world. I'm not alone on this one, right? Like, I'm not crazy when I say that kids learning about critical race theory in school is far less important than those same schools getting funding to be awesome schools so that kids, regardless of any race went to them, would probably have a much better chance in life. Wouldn't you rather we use a fraction of this like critical race theory energy on our massive cybersecurity problems because our country is getting hacked every which way you look, huge issues and data leaks and breaches every single day, ransomware. Our infrastructure is crumbling. We have some of the crappiest infrastructure in the developed world. It's not being fixed. It's gridlocked in the Senate. Texas is so proud of our independent electric grid until it fails. And then it almost failed again in the summer and we're still arguing about critical race theory. We still have kids in cages at the border. You know, Biden administration complains about Trump putting kids in cages, still does it anyway. That's not acceptable for anybody. We gotta put an end to that. The border in general is basically a complete cluster F right now. I'm trying not to get demonetized on this video. It's being used as nothing but a giant vote farm for one way or another. Coronavirus numbers are going insane. The, 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 the Delta variant's blowing up. There might be another pandemic, I don't know. We still don't have legalized cannabis in the United States, even though an overwhelming majority of people in a majority of states support this and like 70% of people in the US actually have it. If you live in a state that doesn't have legal weed, you're in a minority. We can't talk about these issues. We can't solve any of these problems. We can't fix our roads. We can't deal with our border crisis and we can't handle coronavirus because we're too busy fighting each other at like PTA meetings about critical race theory. In the US, we managed to mobilize parents, elected representatives, and blue check marks from around the world to fight for or against anything that even looks like critical race theory. The term itself is so disambiguous now that almost anything can mean critical race theory. If you were to teach about freedom riders during the civil rights movement, it might be critical race theory. If you were to go to school and learn about Nat Turner's slave rebellion and how he decided not to kill white trash because they were so poor and destitute they were barely better off than the slaves, that would be considered critical race theory. Explaining recent events to kids like BLM, even a short TLDR of what happened, probably would get lumped into this. Native American anything? What happened to them? Where did they go? Did anything bad happen? Can't talk about that. Critical race theory. Did America do something bad in Vietnam? That's not on the list yet, but I bet in a year from now when I come back and look at this video, it's going to be there. And the frustrating part of this for me, the most like infuriating thing is that this fifth grade level mind trick is working and it's working brilliantly right now. Parents are showing up at school board meetings, outside a politician's office, protesting at schools, just coming out in droves to protest against critical race theory. But did they show up when they started teaching math like this? Who does math like this? Nobody does math like this. This is why it's so hard for American students to become engineers because this is a stupid way to learn math, just objectively. 
Did they show up when schools started losing their funding? What about when teachers started getting paid less and less? Why don't parents show up in waves and droves to uh, get the state to pay for like continued training for teachers? Why don't they show up to make sure that their kids have updated books, equipment, safety features, like I don't know, stuff in the school? They're, they're, they're so dilapidated. Why don't they show up when their kids are super dumb and they keep getting passed? You know, most kids in public school can just pass by just showing up and putting in like, just writing your name on a piece of paper and kind of being there. You could get passed along for years. There are students in the United States that graduate high school barely able to read. Our public school systems are lagging woefully behind international standards. We're not even top 10. We're like top 20, 25, kind of. We're getting crushed by Russia, Estonia, and Portugal. These aren't exactly the schools that you would think about as being insanely like up-to-date and well-funded, but they're just crushing us in international school rankings. And that's on average. I mean, there's gonna be places that are way worse. There are some school districts in the US that are 100 complete, just totally screwed up, and they're not turning out functional adults. They're turning out kids that can't read, they can't do basic math, they're turning out kids that don't know how to drive, they don't know their basic constitutional rights, they don't know what the Constitution means or does, they couldn't identify Australia on a map, they don't know how to vote or how to register to vote, they don't know how to pay their taxes, they don't know the very basics of budgeting, investing, economics, nothing useful. And yet, the parents and our politicians are fighting tooth and nail for critical race theory to be banned. It doesn't matter. You could, I would rather just teach them the actual, like crazy, highest level Marxist version of this theory in school, as long as we would also teach them basic things about their constitutional rights or how to vote or how to budget their finances. Just, it's so frustrating. So fighting critical race theory this hard and being this terrified of it is, in my opinion, a massive waste of everyone's time. The actual theory isn't even taught in schools. Most schools don't really even use components of these teachings. Some do. The ones that do have them very heavily watered down so that a child could understand it because they're teaching children. And most of this is just stuff that kids are going to have to hear about during their very first diversity seminar if they get hired at a big company. It's stuff that you have to deal with as an adult. And yes, yeah, some schools do crazy stuff. I read some crazy examples. I read some sort of bad eggs problems, some crazy stupid teachers problem. But how is that different than before? Bro, my teachers taught me all kinds of crazy stuff when I was growing up, public school and private school. You j just think right now, all of you have had a teacher in your life. You've all had at least one, if not two or three, completely cuckoo crazy teachers. Crazy gonna crazy no matter what. It's no different than them teaching history or math wrong, in my opinion. So I think this is a big nothing burger. I think this is a waste of everyone's time. I think it was a waste of my time to have to like make this video to hopefully do something good in the world to maybe calm somebody down or help point that effort at something more productive or at least give a very good example about issue framing or issue distractionism. So it's a totally different thing because this issue distracts us from pushing for things that we actually need like funding for these schools, electricity in Texas, clean water in Flint, Michigan, better cybersecurity, roads that aren't falling apart. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. I guess I guess I just don't understand how the world works. I'm too stupid. I'd rather I'd rather have electricity and roads than I would worry about if my kids are learning something that's like a boring diversity seminar that they're going to see when they graduate anyway. So that's my piece on this. And I, I hope that some of you agree. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.